Ja, goede, goedemiddag allemaal. Uh, hello, good morning everybody. Welcome in the Bali. Welcome at this uh, uh, wonderful uh, venue which has a uh, which uh, which will program this wonderful debate about what's cooking in Europe. So in a way we're in a kind of a restaurant setting, no food. So we'll do the tasting through the senses. We will do the tasting and the discovery of food, of European identity, through what we can imagine in our head, how the food would taste. But and we, I will go to do this with uh, two great uh, guests. I will introduce them shortly. Uh, but I will tell you that, um, I have to tell you now that my name is Abdelkader Benali and this uh, program will be live streamed online. Uh, we have a guest in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, Basque, uh, San Sebastian, Elena Arzak, uh, chef, and uh, at my table, uh, Joris Beidendijk from Rijks, restaurant Rijks in Amsterdam, who found time to be here. It's an honor. And it's around the corner. So it's lucky. all around the corner. Okay, <laughs> yes. That's, oh, yeah. oh, it's around the corner. <laughs> um, we're going to go online, so let's start. Welcome uh, all. My name is Abdelkader Benali and I will be your host during this program, What's Cooking in Europe, as a part of the Festival Forum on European Culture. Once again, welcome in Amsterdam. This year, the festival theme is We the People. I will enter into a conversation this morning with two internationally acclaimed chefs to speak about identity and culinary traditions. I'm very excited about this. Already saying this makes me hungry. I want to welcome everybody present here live at the Bali. Hello, Dag iedereen. And you, of course, watching us through the live stream across Europe and beyond. So what does our food say about our identity and culture? And in what ways can chefs influence culinary traditions? We are going to discuss these very interesting topics and questions with Joris Beidendijk, famous from Rijks Restaurant who was awarded a couple of years ago one Michelin star. How old are you, Joris? 36. And how old were you when you got the Michelin star? The first one when I was 28, and the second one, I think I was about 30, 31. Okay, so, so as a chef, you're already, you're now in the, you're already there. I was lucky. You were lucky. No, you were not lucky. I, well, maybe I'm going. We're going to talk about this. <laughs> and um, welcome, Joris. And we have, uh, and we're tuning in from San Sebastian. Is Elena Arzak. She is a chef from the Arzak family restaurant that has been there for already 120 years. Hi, hi, uh, Elena. Hola. 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 Yeah. How do you? Hola. How do uh, you? I think you speak Basque. You speak Caicho. some Basque? Caicho. 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 <laughs> well, your cooking is famous all over the world. You're, you're like, you're a culinary superstar. Three Michelin stars in your uh, family restaurant for a very long time now. And you're being seen as one of the best female chefs worldwide. So let's start uh, with you. Uh, before we go into talking about your signature dishes and what makes your... Uh, uh, what makes your restaurant uh, cooking, we're going to watch a short video of Elena. Zias Rosinath for the height of flavor. To know us is to know our respect for original flavors. If it's not delicious, it has no place at our table. Why is for yolk, for the beginning, the egg, for yin and for yang, balance, the core, the essence. X marks the spot, Basque, our secret ingredient, that intangible thing from here. W is for wasabi, Japan, Peru, Nikai, crossroads, contrasts, opposites attract. V is for vanguard, our food is about evolution and risk, trying, failing, starting over, and then tasting and discussing and trying again until we can feel it. U is for umami, sweet, salty, bitter, acidic. T is for time, seasonality, sustainable production, awareness, supporting a community. S is for sensations and sentiments. 
forest for roots that help us grow, move forward, and fly without losing sight of our origins. Key was for quality time around a table with friends, strangers, or just by ourselves. P is for pioneers. O is for Ungriatori, welcome in Basque. We cook for our guests, and their opinion is what matters most. Enye, that mysterious letter that lives on in the children we once were. It feeds our curiosity, zest for experimentation, and playfulness. N is for new Basque cuisine, a path forged by a crazy few and now embraced by a whole nation, which has put us on the worldwide gastronomic path. M is for market. All of our dishes start every morning in La Brecha and San Martin, doing the shopping, chatting with the farm ladies, and the fishmongers. L is for laboratory, for Shabi, Igor, Elena, and Juan Mari for a test kitchen that does an infinite number of experiments to create 50 new dishes a year. K is for knowledge, respecting our local products. J is for joyous, for jam-packed days, jazzy nights, and joyful reunions. I is for intensity, for a cuisine born of a proud and intense land. H is for heritage and humility, memory, respect, because the essence of who we were lives on in the flavors of what we make. G is for good, good food, good flavors, good taste. F is for fulfillment. We push ourselves, we create, we innovate, and we take risks. But we never forget that none of this makes any sense if we don't transmit our own happiness and fulfillment. E is for extrapolate. Read, pick, choose, or steal. Knowledge and experiences from art, nature, design, literature, movies, people in life, and apply them to our dishes. D is for Donosti, San Sebastian. C is for cooking. We're cooks, and that's how we want to be remembered. Fame has forced us out of the kitchen, but as soon as we can, we'd rather be back there among the clatter of pans and heat of the stove. B is for Big Wall of Flavor, an archive of tastes with more than 1,500 products from every corner of the world. An archive that lets us be rich in experiences and without which we couldn't cook. A is for Aita, Ama, Amona, and for Elena, for a family that's been cooking in this house since 1897. A is for Arthak. I mean, this is this is not a restaurant. It's a museum <laughs> of food. It, it's 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 a it's there is so much history, passion, tradition, heritage, hospitality there. I consider you both more as artists and as just you know what I'm doing in the kitchen. I want to go to you, Elena. You were born in a very culinary family. I, I read somewhere that it's actually your grandmother who established the family name because after the death of her husband, she had to carry on on herself in the 50s, 60s. Is this true? See, sí, the restaurant was founded, bueno, first of all, hi everybody. Hello. I'm very happy to be with you and that you invite me to take part in this forum that uh, I find is a genius idea. Coming back to my family history, I'm the fourth generation. My grandmother took over the restaurant. She got a widow very young and she was a chef in the popular uh, way, and she was uh, specialized in banquets, and she was a great chef. My great-grandparents, my great-grandmother was also a chef, and then after my grandmother, my father. So as you can see, and you pointed, uh, there is a lot of history behind, but what we don't forget is we are chefs. We like to be chefs, like juries, and and is in the in the blood. I'm happy you could show the video because it's for me very sentimental video, and I wanted to share with everybody. It it brings a lot of sentiments also to us here in Amsterdam. But I want to say something about your grandmother's great grandmother, all chefs. It it puts some responsibility on the shoulders. Was this idea of you know, stepping in, becoming a culinary professional, professional yourself. Was it something, something you, you considered from an early age or did you have to, to get there? No, I did consider from the early age, uh, when you belong to a family where the food is the most important, some of the children get contagious and others not. <laughs> of course, it was completely free that I chose. And uh, for example, <coughs> my sister is historian of art and she uh, is very specialized in art and adults gastronomy. She has become our advisor in art and gastronomy, mm. but uh, she likes history and she likes art. 
So they never push me. And when you are free to do something, it's always good because they don't push you. Okay. And so I started and I told my parents, don't, don't worry if I don't like that or it's not the idea I had. I will change very quick and very fast mm -hmm. to something else. But, you know, uh, if you adore uh, the gastronomy and the cooking, you never want to stop it. Yeah. I say this because I know from, from chefs and, 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 and people who, who, who cater that it's, it's very, very hard work. You have no personal life in a way. So your commitment has to be like 200%. And that brings me to, the, to this maybe an intimate question. What was the first dish or food you tasted that, that made you say, I want to become a chef? A particular dish. See, uh, I remember when uh, I was a child, you know, the chefs... Not only now, before, all the chefs in the world, they had a very uh, important rule and very important uh, idea that it's not the waste in the kitchen about food. Because ethical, a chef doesn't want to have waste. So in all the uh, experiments that made my father in the, in the restaurant that were left, they brought them home. <laughs> no, I see a part of... Uh, my sister and me, we were very close, and we went every day to the restaurant. So uh, from one side, there are flavors like boiling crabs or rice milk that we have been in the, in the mind. But I remind, I, I, rem I think I was six years old the first time I tried truffle, a ginger, or a, even a Chinese orange. No, because... <laughs> everything was left yeah. and so these all these flavors nobody knew but we needed to finish them at home so imagine during three days having fish with truffle a bread with truffle because <laughs> and, and in the beginning the truffle for me was a taste like earth yeah the first bite i didn't like it and you know after two days i adored wow. and today is the day that i adore truffle for example. And what about ginger? Ginger, uh, <laughs> uh, I use a lot. In our way of cooking, there is a, a way of cooking where the Basque, there are some ingredients that we like best and others worst. It doesn't mean that we have the truth of everything. Doesn't, I don't like, nobody's right in the flavor, but it's your habitudes. Okay. And for example, we like... Uh, Firstly, we like garlic, we like olive oil, but ginger belongs to one of the spices that are not Basque from abroad that we adore. So I use uh, ginger to everything, and so did my father. Okay. My father did uh, a study because he is very adventurous of Chinese food, and then and uh, he introduced lot of ginger in our food. Well, I have to say, you, you, your restaurant is in, in San Sebastian. You go all, all over the world. But I found out that San Sebastian has the highest density of Michelin stars in the world. Incredible. Your, your father, uh, of course, uh, 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 taught you uh, this tradition of the family. But is your style different from your father's? Uh, from one side, the flavor is very similar. Uh, we don't know, perhaps because we belong to the same family. Some people say that you can heritage. I don't really know. Some experts say the flavor you can heritage, or others say uh, you can train it. I'm, perhaps I'm the three of them. I train it. I, perhaps I heritage. I think you can heritage a little bit, but the training is very important. Yeah. yeah. And. Uh, um, for me, for me, it's important that you like it. You like to eat. If you don't like to eat, you cannot be, become a chef, no? But uh, the difference, especially is in the generation of my father, they did a composition of plates where the plate, and they did very nicely, uh, had many, many ingredients. Uh, my generation is more with less ingredients, more strong flavors. And uh, so it's more and more sim simple, not simple, but uh, less full. Yeah. And in Jerry's, it's even less. I saw in his so nice recipe, there are not so many ingredients. Mm. So I think the future is going to have an apparently simplicity 
and taking value. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that what they did before was not right. Yeah. You understand? It's the changing yeah. of the world. But your generation, uh, I'm going to talk with this, thank you, with your audience, you brought this essential cooking in a way, you, you almost made it mainstream because it has become part of our everyday life to think about pure tastes. I think that's very interesting that you mentioned this. And I'm going to Joris for now because that's also a video of you. Dutch culinary tradition. How does that feel? <laughs> That's what we try to do. <laughs> yeah. We are always in search for um, beautiful products and producers from the Netherlands because it's a logic to work with stuff from not too far away. Why is this so important for you? It's part of our, let's call it our philosophy. It's also because we are based uh, on the, in the Rijksmuseum where you have all the culture heritage of the Netherlands. And we're kind of the place where you find the culinary heritage of the Netherlands. Mm. And um, of course, it's not a, not a coincidence that I, that I became the chef there because it was already part of my, yeah, my idea of cooking. Doesn't mean that we don't use ginger, that we don't use wasabi, etc., etc., because we love those flavors as well. But first, we look around the corner if we can find something before we go elsewhere. Elena named uh, parsley as a typical Basque ingredient in a restaurant. What is your typical Dutch ingredient you cannot do without in your in cuisine? Um, cheese is very uh, typical. So do you put cheese in desserts? Uh, not in desserts, but pre-desserts. Pre-desserts, yeah. And in fa uh, savory dishes. But yeah, we're, we're pretty proud on, um, on the beautiful uh, Gouda cheeses we have in the Netherlands and all these... Um, yeah, very strong aged cheeses. Yeah, we have we have amazing cheese. It's incredible. I have, when, when when friends come from from abroad, they don't want to go to Rijks Museum or they want to go to the cheese shop. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you have to watch out because there are good <laughs> cheese shops and there are bad cheese. Shops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. give me the good addresses later on. Exactly. So, but there's also um, so these are the traditional flavors. Well. Uh, and there's a big question, when do you call something traditional? Yeah. Because yeah. Um, the history of cheese is long, but the histor history of Gouda cheeses and Leitze cheeses is uh, relatively long. Mm. Um, but there's, o there's also the new flavors. For example, the dish where we will talk about later, yeah. uh, I use this uh, Dutch soya sauce. So uh, soya sauce, is, uh, of course, is not typical Dutch. But uh, the guys that make these soya sauce jumped in the Japanese tradition and they managed to create, uh, as the only one in Europe, a traditional brewed soya sauce with Dutch ingredients. So, and, the, and then you mix it with cheese or is all cheese no, this part is, of this, it? No, we use this in, uh, in several sauces okay. because it just gives, gives an umami punch. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's what we want, umami punch. Um, you, I mean, uh, Elena, it comes from a, from a heritage of uh, cuisiniers. You are the new kid on the block, uh, you know, a go boy from the hood outside who wanted to become a chef. Yes. What, what, what happened? Well, in my family, uh, we love food as well, but uh, we don't have professional chefs in the family. We've got um, lovers of food in the family. And my parents, well, we, I grew up um, in Amsterdam and uh, my parents uh, bought this farm, I think about 35 or 40 years ago in Belgium, like three and a half hours drive from Amsterdam. And a real farm needs to live. So we had to go to Belgium every Friday after school with all my brothers mm. 
to to work on the farm and um, and if you have a farm and you have a vegetable garden you use those vegetables and you use that garden so um, that was kind of a standard to use our own vegetables and kind of a luxury as well um, and I think that's the, the 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 first like the seed that that become became my 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 passion actually um, all my brothers and all my, my you know my in my family everyone loves food. But um, when I started as a dishwasher in a restaurant and I saw like what you could also do with a chicken mm. or also could do with um, uh, veal bones, uh, that what for me was the, the moment that I thought like, wow, that, that's next level. And I want to, to make that second step. And what attracted you in that? What was it that because that, that you could see, oh, the, uh, uh, that chicken is being brought in and it has been turned through different hands is something incredibly delicate and delicious. Was that it, the transformational process of it? I could so see the similarities between um, home cooking and uh, restaurant cooking. Uh, and the similarities were that in both places we were using quality ingredients. But the magic that chefs do in restaurants triggered me. And especially if you ask Elena, what was the first time you thought like, I want to become yeah. a chef? For me, it was when a chef gave me a spoon of broth. Like I saw, I was working there for a couple of days a week and, um, and there were a few bones came in. He shoved them in the oven, roasted them. Yeah. And I, saw, I thought like, what are you going to do with veal bones? Oh yeah. And put them in a big pot, oh. uh, cook it for a couple of days, reduce it, oh, yeah. and then he gave me a spoon of fuel broth. Oh, this is so good. Oh, so good. Yeah. And that for me yeah. was like, yeah. what the fuck? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. This, this, so, the savory, <laughs> salty. Yes, and, and umami. Like wet, like yeah. wet. All, yes. all, yeah. And it's like so full of flavor. And, and that for me was like, okay, wow, this is kind of magic. This and I want to learn that. I want to live for this. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, I'm now into the broth. But, <laughs> but we're going to talk about recipes. Because you both of you brought two recipes. Uh, Joros, you made this beautiful cookbook. I have it at home when it came Thank out. You. I was the first one to buy it. It's, in my, it's, in, it's, in, it's on my bookshelf. It's Thank like a status you. object. Um, uh, Elena, you, you brought a recipe. I think you also made cookbooks, Elena. Si. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm, go si. I'm going to get them very, very, very soon. <laughs> Um, let's, Elena, what is your recipe? Because you brought a recipe that says something about European cuisine, that, that represents European identity. So I need to admit, when you pose uh, the question, uh, uh, sorry about the pronunciation of your name, Abdelkader. Perfect. Abdelkader? Yes. Because you, uh, it's the origin Berber, we are Basque, yes, and he said yes, yes, that it could yes. be something uh, I, between I, I us. I understand Basque fluently. Eh? <laughs> I'm happy. Azul. So, <laughs> eh? Azul. Yeah. No, then when you uh, asked me to do that, wow, uh, it was a big question. The, that question is so wide and so interesting that could be for one book. Yeah. What? Yeah. It, so I said it could be a supposed European recipe. Yeah. Because, you know, uh, it's not the same being from San Sebastian. It's not the same being from Amsterdam. Yeah. So, you know? so, so what makes it European is that it is the fact that it's super, super local. See, I try to combine. I use a mackerel that yeah. is, uh, exists in different food cultures in whole Europe, even in the Atlantic Sea and in the Mediterranean mm -hmm. Sea and in the Nordic countries. Yeah. So this is why I use a, a fish that from one side is very local, that Joris was pointing that is important to the chefs, and also using ingredients like the is marinated in apple vinegar that also exists in whole Europe. And uh, the mackerel is also with tomato. And the tomato is dry tomato mixed with fresh tomato. The tomato is, a, for me, a very interesting ingredient because before it didn't exist in Europe. Yeah. And we adopted it from, from America. And this is, for me, very important to understand mm. that with the history of the food, some ingredients, because people move the culture is moving, the uh, migration is very important today, is products that do don't belong to our culture stay forever, like the tomato, for example. 
What, what uh, uh, is this? Is it your signature dish, Elena? This is a recipe you you invented, or is it something that was already around in families and now you're using? You you, you no. made it into to 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 a Michelin star dish. It's something we invented not long ago, very few time ago, and uh, for me had the all the all the resume of everything you wanted no from one side has the tradition of the local fish yeah. and uh, uh, supporting the suppliers the fishmongers also the uh, respect of the tomato the the ingredients and also as technique the technique is because we use uh, a broth that is a uh, with collagen, we extract the collagen of the fish bones and the skin that you need to be very precise and you need innovation and technique. And we discover like a seaweed that is a, a sea grape, very special in texture. So for me, that plate is, uh, this is why I chose it, is a, a plate that resumes everything that could, could be European and that people could understand. Can I make this recipe at home? I think so. Oh, the, if, if you don't uh, get the, the sea grapes, because I can see you like to even to try to cook, use another seaweed. Elena, you don't... sea grapes Yours. are now uh, produced in the Netherlands. So we are... Well, so is it produced in the Netherlands, sea grapes? Yes. Just, just, uh, just a month ago. I want absolutely, when it's possible, uh, one bottle of your soy sauce, because the you. Dutch soy sauce, I'm sure, well, is really great. The, ladies and, and gentlemen, we're having ex we have European chefs exchange <laughs> on the highest level. I, I'm, I'm out. <laughs> no, you also, you also. You can also, uh, uh, you pointed the cheese. The cheese for me is one of my favorite meals. So all the guests from Holland that come to Arzac, some of them bring all me cheese. So it's to remind them that please, when they come back, that they bring me the cheese. Once I was in a food congress in the, in Svole, Svole. Uh, organized by Johnny Bohr and Therese, and uh, it was really also with a lot of producers, farmers, and you know, I can, it was really very interesting. In Holland, you respect a lot the nature, it's, I'm happy about. And in that congress, uh, it was called Chef Revolution, I came back with the with my suitcase full of cheese. So please don't forget it. Eh? Okay, good. Okay, I want I want to talk about one ingredient. Can can the recipe go one page black, please, please, because I want to talk about this incredible uh, addition of 85 grams of toasted hazelnut. And I think hazelnut is is a delicious thing to have in food. But I never thought that you could put it in a mackerel. Uh, no, normally, when you do a recipe, uh, don't forget that in our case, we want to do, to have pleasure and flavor. No, uh, we are rethinking all the time to uh, rehave again all the pleasure that the food can add you. And uh, you know, the chefs that we learn to be creative, we know that the only way is to taste to try and to taste. And why not to use hazelnut and almonds? In, 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 in the Basque and in the Spanish food, we adore dry fruits. And uh, uh, because uh, for us is something that also we like mushrooms. For me, the, the way of mushrooms and the way of dry fruits is very, very, mm -hmm. can be very similar. So, but what is important is that everything you use you like it. Also, you need to find the balance. The balance. Imagine a vinaigrette has vinegar, salt, and, be and olive oil. You need to know, to know the basis, like Joris was saying before about the broth. And uh, you need, you can substitute the vinegar of my vinaigrette with le for lemon juice, great, or another citrus, or another acidity. So, I don't like that people think we mix for mixing. Of course, I cannot explain exactly all the ingredients because I use because I like, you understand? But uh, for me, the, the whole recipe needs to be happiness and have a, fla uh, a flavor. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, I can see the fat, you know, mackerel, fat fish and, and the hazelnut. It's already coming somewhere here. Beautiful. Thank you, uh, Elena, for sharing this with us. I'm going to try it and send you a picture. Uh, Joris, you, 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 you also chose a recipe out of your restaurant or, yes. your, fav or your signature dish. What is it? Yeah, first of all, the, as, as Elena also mentioned, the question of like, um, what, is, what is a typical European dish? Like, yeah. that question was so difficult that I think that the answer why, is also... Why is it difficult? Because there's, um, first of all, there's, let's say, four big, uh, well-known, well-promoted cuisines in, in Europe, uh, mostly Mediterranean, so it, Italy, France, yeah. uh, France, well, south of France, Mediterranean, but yeah. uh, France and Spain. And of course, there's this new movement, the Nordic cuisine. Yeah. Um, and there are not a lot of similarities. There's not like a, a Nordic, Spanish, Italian, French dish uh, that you can... But I have the feeling something is cooking. This, yeah, definitely, this, yeah. definitely. No. But so, there, so the answer to the question is, of course, a, a symbolic uh, answer. Yeah. And it's also... What is this dish to me? And uh, the dish I cho choose, uh, I chose, is uh, one of our signature dishes with beetroot and um, this sauce with this beautiful uh, Tomasu soya sauce. So, so beetroot for me, it's, it's rode beet. Eh? Rode beet. Okay. Yes. Wow. So, and beetroot is um, one of the few vegetables in the Netherlands that is actually from the Netherlands, yeah. okay. like all these aubergine, courgette, potato, tomato, etc. Yeah. Uh, a lot of beans. Yeah. They don't come originally from the Netherlands. So yeah. beetroot is. Okay. So that's why I picked beetroot. And um, it's such a humble vegetable. Yeah. And we try to prepare it in a way to give it so much more yeah. podium, so much more uh, flavor. So we slice it in thin slices, cook it in, in his, its own juice, reduce the juice, so you get a really strong flavor. Everyone that tastes yeah. this dish doesn't need any meat. Yours, yours. I'm going to add an, a, 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 a word to the, to the taste of, of beetroot, which is sandy. It's a bit, you know, so, you know, th th this... It can be art, can yes, be earthy, yeah. Yeah. but if you... How do you do, how you... So I would say if you, if you confit the beetroot mm -hmm. long enough, it becomes samiyak. And I don't know the word in English, yep. but um, and together with this uh, with this uh, beurre blanc, this fatty sauce with flavored with the with the soya sauce, you don't need more. And I have to admit that five years ago, I didn't feel c uh, confident um, enough to serve it like this. So, um, like Elena said, like I also was trained with with plates with a lot of ingredients. So the first time we had this dish on the menu was like four or five years ago. There was the same sauce, there was the, uh, a, a kind of preparation of beetroot, but also many more. So there was a beetroot puree, a beetroot mm. sweet and sour, mm. a raw mm. beetroot, a puffed mm. uh, beetroot in salt crust or whatever, with some salads, with some vinegars and vinaigrettes, etc., and the sauce. And then we had a lot of um, talks about like what, what, uh, what is the essence of a dish? And if you talk about this beetroot dish, we, we were talking about it and we said, okay, it's the beetroot, the right preparation of beetroot with the right sauce and that's it. Mm. Okay, why do we serve all the rest? Yeah. And okay. that's how this dish re uh, became like this so, and reduced. So you made this dish, it's one, I actually had it in, in the, I was once invited to eat, I, I, of course, you know, I was, I had to be invited to, <laughs> to, to get a seat at the table and I had this dish, it was, yeah, it's bomb. Amazing, but you make this dish, you create it as an artist, and then you have to, it's on exposition for the first time. Do you stand in the room and see how the reactions are in the faces? Yes, yes, we, we, we really want to know what, what guests say and think. Sometime, like uh, this week, uh, one of my colleagues uh, created a beautiful dessert made of the flour of Topinambur, of Jerusalem artichoke. There's a lot of flavor in it. Mm. And I think it combines really well with, with sweet, with sweet flavors. 
but I really wonder how our guests will re yeah. respond. Because so what do you do? You stand in a corner and you, you, or well, first, with binoculars? First, first we, we serve it to our regular guests and, and uh, listen you to their You can always opinion. call me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you, and then they come and they sit? Yes, and we are very curious how they, um, how they react because uh, they are, we, we know that they are honest with us yeah. and, um, and uh, you know, uh, flavors that we in the kitchen we like. We, we eat so many stuff all year long, all day long. We go out for dinner. Yeah. Uh, we go to restaurants like Arzak, creative restaurants. So we love to explore new flavors um, and many people love to stick to the flavors they know. So we have to find a balance in that as well. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, back to Elena. Hello. Elena. Was listening. Very interesting. Have you been in the restaurant? Have you been in the Rijks? Uh, not yet. I've been in the museum uh, because I like museums. And uh, I was many years ago in last time in Amsterdam, and I went to the bar that was there, but not to juries. Okay. But uh, I, I, I need to go. I need to go completely because I need to congratulate such a nice recipe and looks so uh, is so so sensible. The colors, you know. I, I want to eat that. And is what you explain is really very, is my, my way. I like this type of recipes. I, I want you to come to Amsterdam and to the Rijksmuseum <laughs> and I want to be part of the, of the energy. Um, so, Elena, you come from Basque country, which, ha which has this, this Pincho culture. I mean, you, 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 I remember in the 90s, suddenly Pincho was popping up all over the world. Uh, you have been, and this, this cuisine has been refined again and refined. There is a, there's a, a what, you, what you sometimes think about cultures with a deep colonial tradition is that they're very conservative and not open to change. But to me, it seems Basque cuisine is very much open to change. Can you, can you explain this to me? See, why, why there's this openness? Because see, of the sea? Uh, because of the No, the nobody... I'm talking about gastronomy, but in general, nobody knows why in the Basque area, in the Basque country, are so, so many good restaurants, Michelin star restaurants, or uh, even the, the, the tapas, the pinchos bars. Everybody adores the food. Yeah. I think that from one side, I think that from one side, we are geolo ge uh, geographically very well connected. Then from other side, the relation to the farmers has been, and the suppliers has been always very tight. Then the revolution that made my father and the colleagues in the 70s, 80s, like, like you said, was also very important for the, for the, for the uh, uh, evolution. And also we are people in the Basque area, people, we are people that want to go further always. We like innovation, we like from one side to respect the essence of our traditions uh, uh, from our cultures, no, doesn't disappear, but always uh, uh, innovating with the time. No? So uh, nobody knows exactly why. I think we are very fortunate. Yeah. And there is a lot of creativity, not only in the food, in many other areas, in the culture, in the Basque area. This is, I think, can be can be, be one of the reasons. Yeah, I, I also understood that Arzak, your family restaurant, the, the local people come to eat. They come in shorts and, 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 and you know, and, 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 you know, in their casual wear. It's like a family, it's almost like, you know, it's three stars Michelin, but it's, it looks like, people say it looks like a family restaurant, like, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, in the neighborhood. See, uh, for us, uh, is uh, we don't want to have uh, social classes in the restaurant. So we want that for us, the food is so important and for the people in San Sebastian, that of course, someone that has more po economical possibilities comes more often. But yeah. there are a lot of people that are really normal from a, a social media class that they earn money, it belongs to our culture. Yeah. Even my friends in the, uh, from school, the colleagues, they earn money and go once a year yeah. to, uh, to, the, to one of the restaurants. For other people that still could be too much money, they make presents to, the, to imagine a gift voucher 
to someone, but everybody comes with no complex, everybody understands a lot, and we treat everybody the same. It's very funny to see the difference. And we think that's the real life. The real life, if you go on the street, look at the street. People are completely different from each other. Yeah. So why not to bring that to the restaurants? No, it's, we are very proud of that. So this, what, uh, thank you, Elena. What, what Elena says you is about that eating out is part of uh, celebrating a local culture, national culture. It's a way of bringing people together, and it may cost something. This is not typical for Dutch culture. You're right. So how did you how did you got the Dutch to, you know to come into your restaurant with the same spirit, or, or wasn't it? Was it? Well, well, first of all, um, um, if you look at our uh, government and you compare it, for example, with the government of France. In France, um, agriculture and food is part of the Ministry of Culture. Mm, okay. In the Netherlands, uh, the uh, agriculture is part of the Ministry of Economics. Yeah. So this is one thing that we have to deal with. That So you're the, in the wrong department. The, the Dutch see food as yeah. money, mm. you know, not as culture. Yeah. Yeah. And this is a long road, yeah, it's uh, true, it's true. And, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a deep dive and yeah. something um, hard to, to change. Yeah. But I have to say that in the past five to eight years, a lot yeah. have changed. You know, this, is, this reminds me of something of my father. He's a butcher in, in, uh, in uh, Rotterdam. And that, that when he came to Holland, this whole first generation, they would always go out to the local markets and all the fish market, and they, they would buy beautiful fish, you know, mackerel and, and, and all kinds of fish. There was such abundance, but you would never he hear the Dutch talk about this. Mm -hmm. It was seen like something, you know, was taken for granted. Well, yeah. for us, it was like, wow, we have so much coming in from outside, but also the local fishes. Yeah, yeah. Vegetables and, and not and affordable. Yeah, so yeah. You know, we are changing and there's more, uh, there's a, a young generation of chefs um, uh, that has, that is, has, we've, we've got more and more good restaurants on yeah. diff different levels and so, so something is changing in the yeah. Netherlands, but yes. But, but then you, you have this restaurant Rijks, high stakes, and then you start serving Dutch food. Was there something of a risk in that, that you thought is the, is the Dutch Eater going to accept the fact that what I'm going to give to him is local? I don't think uh, there was a risk. I think um, uh, the Dutch like to explore new things. Um, and I think the Dutch, would, they would like to be proud of what they have, but they just don't know because yeah. there's, there's all the good food that we export and there's a lot of food that we import. Yeah. Um, and the popular restaurants back in the days, like 20 years ago, were the Chinese restaurants, Italian restaurants, yeah. or Spanish restaurants. Yeah. And nowadays, this new, like, let's call it the fourth generation of chefs, because the first real generation was in the 80s, and with Cas Spijkers, yeah. which was a famous chef. Yeah. And I think I'm, I'm being part of the fourth generation of chefs, which is a, a big group of chefs that really want to find out what are the good products from our own soil, from our own waters, from from the Netherlands, and they put it on the menu, and the people, they love it. The people that go out for dinner, they love to explore that, and they love to know it, and they everyone is is like, wow, when they taste this sauce with this, the tomasu mm. soya sauce, and they say, they say, where can I buy it? So mm. they're open, yeah. but we need to, yeah. to learn. I mean, in a way, you're also civilizing, civilizing the, the industry. You're creating new ideas, homegrown and you're saying look what we can do what is possible yeah. so in a way you inspire a lot of people do you do you feel that this this is happening uh, let's hope let's hope I, I i don't know but i think um a lot of people uh love the fact that we are cooking this local yeah, yeah. you know elena we have this thing in holland called pindakaas peanut butter it's very dutch and, and you know in it, back in the days peanut butter you ate it but nowadays peanut butter has become like a millennial thing you know, it's a very much on fog. All kind of peanut butters, and it tastes very good. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're suddenly people, you know, like microbreweries, you know. Yeah. You know, all this, and I think, I think yours, you're maybe a bit too shy in your generation too. You're very, I think you're very important for these young people who, who in a way, are, who look at you and see how daring you are and what you do, and that you, that you in a way, um, can see that what, you're opening a new path. Do you get responses from young people? about how you work and what you do? Of course, we've got a lot of uh, students that, that, um, 
that apply for a job in, in the restaurants, which is a, a good thing, and we cannot um, take them all, but we can kind of teach uh, and take four students a year. And it's a good thing that we, we are invited as chefs to forums and to symposiums uh, uh, all over the world to, to, to share our philosophy. So in that way, I can see that uh, people are interested in what we do, yeah. yeah. Okay, I think time time goes fast. Uh, we still have we, we only have we still have ten minutes. I'm going to uh, to Elena, I'm going to the the roundup. Um, so, how important is the mission star for you, Elena? How important are those three stars? See, uh, well, uh, my father got the third Michelin star in the year '89. How uh, old were you so then? So I was. You were, uh, you were uh, of course, a, a little child. No, no, no. Oh, no. I, 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 I'm not so young as you think. Oh, okay. I, I'm, okay. I, I feel okay. very young. <laughs> okay. uh, I don't yeah. mind to say I'm 51 and I'm very proud of my age. And I was at that time, I was uh, studying in, the, in, in Switzerland in a hotel school in Luzern, in the Swiss German part. And so, I received a, a phone call. It was my father. Before was no mobiles, you know, my yeah. father phone. And me, what happens? Helena, uh, we got the third Michelin star. I was 19 years old. And so, uh, you know, I'm so scared because, you know, I don't know how many years we are going, I'm going to keep them. And every year I tell him, do you remember that phone call? And today is the day we had that star since the year 89. So uh, from one side, of course, it's a big proud because it's every year to get like a super prize. And to keep it is not easy. You need completely dedication to that. From one side, people is uh, the most important guide in the world and people come to the restaurant because of that guide. And uh, because of the Michelin Guide, we need to admit. Yeah. And uh, uh, we need to, some people ask, you don't feel too much pressure. Of course, there's always pressure. But for me, the pressure is necessary. If uh, you don't have pressure, you relax. No? You relax. You start, in, you stay in your comfortable area and you less and less and less. Helena, what is your secret? You look, you look beautiful, you, you, you speak so passionately, but I know working, having a restaurant on that level, it's like Champions League final every day. See. So how, do, one, you keep, how do you stay sane? From one side is good food. I eat <laughs> very well, okay. I, well, I, I promise you. Yeah. See, see, see. Since the beginning, since yeah. I was a child, my parents were purists of the food. So we ate very natural, my sister and me. And then it's also a little bit genetic. But, okay. uh, you know, I feel happy in my life. Uh, uh, well, there are some days, of course, I'm also tired. But I adore my profession. And, uh, uh, you know, you need to be, uh, especially in these times, to, to, need yeah. to be positive. Yeah. But I'm not joking. Good food and uh, to learn to to eat well is very very yeah. important. So everybody to eat beetroot and mackerel. I'm not joking. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> Elena, you have you have children. You have children. Eh? I'm right. See, they are teenagers now, 15 uh, and 13. Is there a fifth generation coming? I know. I don't know. I cannot force them. I need to wait. For the moment, they are like all of them. Oh, yeah, the yeah, 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 yeah. See, see, see. Yeah, no, okay. but also, I, I, my first uh, uh, pleasure is the food yeah. and the restaurant. Cool. But don't think I'm a uh, work maniatic a little bit, but I like art. Yeah. I like uh, traveling. Traveling yeah. is very important. Yeah. It's, I think, opens the mind to everybody. I like to eat pinchos. I like, uh, I like to... Thanks to my sister, for example, I discovered, I went because we are in Holland. There is a very nice uh, art musician that is called Envin van der Heide. Please listen to them. He does uh, spectacles. And this type of things of, uh, uh, of sound, I repeat, Edwin van der Heide is so incredible. Edwin van der Heide, yeah. See, sorry for my pronunciation. No, 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 no it's... But, you know... 
go to the Rix Museum, go walking, yeah. do something or a, a part of your job, yeah. be multifunctional, yeah. is a, learn to be like having back the surprise of your childhood. Please do something nice. Before, I was only looking for the food. <laughs> and uh, now I learned to see other th nice things yeah. in the world. Eh? Beautiful. Thank you, Elena. Very encouraging. You said pinchos. The way you say pinchos makes me <laughs> hungry again. Yeah, I'm a very simple guy here. I'm turning to you, Joris. Um, um, you did something incredible because uh, Corona came. You had to shut down the, the restaurant. And you also had to fire your wife. <laughs> yes. It how did you, how do you where, where and when did you tell her we're still together I have to fi like, you're fired that's, that's where you have to separate uh, private and uh, she and works work in like, a restaurant yeah and she was working in uh, my second restaurant and of course we had um, we had to lock down the restaurant etc etc and we had to let go unfortunately some of our colleagues um, with a temporary contract and it would be would have been very hypocrite and strange if I would have said like okay you can stay but you guys have to go. So yes, of course, it sounds a bit dramatic. I fired my wife. How did you, uh, now tell me the, the, the concrete situation. You, you know, you said to her, take a seat, darling. Um, I even think she, she asked me, it's like, okay, so this is the moment you have to tell me that oh. I cannot work her anymore? I think, yeah, I think you're right, baby. <laughs> but then she did something wonderful. I, I read an interview in Vogue. She, she, you have a balcony, and she started having a balcony garden. Yes. It's also something people are doing. My, my wife has also a balcony garden. She has green fingers. It's incredible what the things that grow out of it. But your wife started a, a marijuana. Uh, 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 yes. Pantry. Well, well, not only <laughs> not only weed and marijuana, but yes. Yeah, so, um, of course, uh, Corona is is horrible. And um, uh, but okay, there are also positive sides yeah. of Corona. Mm -hmm. We we were forced to stay in, and uh, my wife started. Um, yeah. Uh, like a, 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 a hortus, like a hortus yeah. at home, yeah. uh, and also five uh, beautiful marijuana plants with all the sun we had, <laughs> the sun we had this summer, they uh, did very well. I'm not a smoker, yeah. but um, we uh, created a little yeah. uh, factory. I, th I think your wife should start a third restaurant, call it the balcony. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> It would you have know? been a success. Yeah. So you did something very. Uh, you, you started doing a takeaway. Yes. To, to survive Corona, Deliver, you started delivering at home. Yes. Yeah. So um, before we had to lock down on the 15th of March, uh, we were um, uh, following our colleagues from Asia and from Italy. And we were always two weeks behind. Everything yeah. that happened in the Netherlands, two weeks yeah. later, uh, everything that happened in Italy and Asia, two weeks later, it happened in the Netherlands. And we yeah. saw that our good friends and, and chefs and colleagues from that part of the world started with takeaway during the lockdown. So we thought the week before we had the lockdown, we thought we, we're going to do takeaway as well, even though we are not in a yeah. lockdown yet. Yeah. And that was um, the right decision. So yeah. three or, or two or three days before we had the lockdown, we kicked off with takeaway. And then on the Sunday, the 15th, uh, our prime minister said um, that the restaurant needed to close. And the day after, it exploded. Wow. The takeaway exploded. Really? And we, we served, uh, I think, about 25,000 people uh, during uh, lockdown. What, is, what this tells me is, is how emotionally attached people are to good food. Especially during lockdown. Yeah, <laughs> and you also the, the, people start making pictures of the of the food they had and then post it on Instagram. Yes, so we invited them as well to do that. So um, of course we send it uh, like a QR code with uh, explanations of the food, and we asked the people to because we wanted to stay in contact with our guests. That was one of our uh, main reasons to start with takeaway. Like imagine that you you cannot. Um, uh, bring your guests to the restaurant anymore. We want to stay in touch with them, so let's try to keep on cook, cook, uh, cook for them, um, and let's try to keep uh, the conversation. And that's uh, that's a digital conversation. Oh. So everyone was sharing their way of like they were dressed up. People uh, uh, put their wedding. Uh, dress and, and stuff like that on they, 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 they put everything on the table with candles candlelight and everything and they took photos put it on the in Instagram it was amazing yeah 
What was the dish that made it to the to the to the top? I think the beetroot actually. The beetroot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And the gazpacho. And the green gazpacho. Green gazpacho. Exactly. Yeah. Why? But I'm, you... I'm afraid to talk about gazpacho with a Spanish three oh. star chef. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chef. Oh, yeah. We're afraid to talk about gazpacho. <laughs> no, I'm going to. Uh. No, I'm, I'm confident that uh, I can serve her my gazpacho as well. So we have a date uh, when this uh, pandemic is cal has calmed down. We can travel again. Um, I'm coming with my family to uh, San Sebastian. Uh, to to visit the restaurant of Elena and Elena is coming to the Rijks and we we want we want to be there we want to come and see <laughs> and and share your stories because there's a wonderful synergy going on here. I would like to thank both of you uh, for joining me and sharing their uh, your ideas. We continue here, ladies and gentlemen, with some questions from the live audience. And I want to thank you for your attention. The forum on European culture continues. Please check the website for the full program. We are back online at 1.30 p.m. with the program Power to the People. I hope to see you then. Goodbye.